On white side is Yuri Averbach, who prefers slower positional chess, while his opponent Alexander Kotov typically enjoys more complicated tactical positions. Strong GMs back at their time are also authors of well-known chess literature. In fact, one of the first chess books I've read is A Road to Mastery, written by these two players together. We had d4, knight f6, c4, d6, knight f3, knight bd7, knight c3, e5, e4, bishop e7. This opening is called Old Indian Defense. And in order to be properly played, it requires a deeper understanding of pawn structure. When you see the pawn chain starting from c7, ending on e5, you should immediately relate it with the king's Indian defense and black's plan to push f7, f5 at the right moment. Sure, there are significant differences between this and proper king's Indian, and we need to underline those in order to completely grasp the critical features of this opening. First, black doesn't have g6. It means there is no point for white to push the h-pawn in order to open the h-file and attack black's king which sometimes is seen in the Samish variation of the King's Indian. Second difference is that the dark square bishop is standing on e7, not on g7. This means all ideas related with white pinning black f6 knight won't be sensible here. It also means that the black dark square bishop develops in one instead of using two moves the way it is typically done in the King's Indian. Now, the differences won't qualify the old Indian defense as better than the King's Indian. It has its own drawbacks, of course. For example, why doesn't need to rush to close the center with d4, d5? Because there is no pressure against white's d4 pawn. It often gets under pressure by the black's g7 bishop in the King's Indian, and white rushes to close the center, which gives black a chance to strike with their favorite f7, f5. Now, guided by this fact, leading white pieces, we are not going to rush here in the old Indian with d4, d5, but first develop our pieces. That's why we had here bishop e2. Many students of mine would ask why this bishop doesn't go to d3. There is no pin to break, so why wouldn't we put it a bit more towards the center? The answer is that it blocks the queen's influence on d4 pawn, and sometimes black is able to exploit that. Now, on the other side, that bishop on d3 isn't really better than on e2, since it's looking at its own pawn on e4. Black castled and white castles as well, and c6. Typical black's setup in the old Indian, and it looks like the Philidor defense. The only difference is that here white has their c pawn on c4, while in the Philidor it is still on c2. The c4 pawn supports white's interests on the queen side, since there is definitely more space for white on that part of the board. Right, white played queen c2. Now, before the game gets more concrete, or before we play d5, eventually we'll need to do it. I prefer to keep my queen on d1, and instead of playing queen c2, I would shift the e2 bishop to f1. You can assume that the f1 rook needs to go to e1 in that case, which you'll find useful once the d5 is done, and black knight gets to c5, attacking our e4 pawn. However, in the game we had queen c2, which also aims to defend the e4 pawn. But to me, it seems like after d5 and c6 takes d5, followed by c4 takes d5, the c file becomes open and white queen won't feel too happy, especially once black rook gets to c8. First, let's test the immediate d5. After knight to c5, knight d2, a5, securing that the c5 knight stays on this beautiful spot. Let's say rook b1. Bishop d7, b3, c takes d5, and c takes d5. Black has b5. Very good move, because white can't win a pawn since the e4 is hanging at the end. Black manages to overtake white's initial advantage on the queen side this way. This is actually one of the ideas having the c6 involved. 
I'm going back, black played rook e8. And this move is also usually seen as a bit confusing. What black is doing there is practically speeding up white in pushing e5. Since the e8 rook is about to be threatening the e4 pawn. Also, it vacates the f8 square for their dark square bishop, which doesn't necessarily make it better, but at least it is not standing on the way of other pieces. White continues with rook d1. On one end, eyeing the black's queen, forcing her to move to c7, after which white's queen on c2 won't be vulnerable to the eventual rook c8. On the other end, this move is kind of discouraging black from trading on d4 was the d6 pawn would be a direct target for the white's rook. Black played bishop f8. White goes with rook b1, preparing to push b4. And you may be asking why not to just push immediately. Problem is the following line. b4, a5, b5, and then let's say queen c7. After which black is going to take on d4 and occupy the c5 square with their, of course, d7 knight. For example, h3, e takes d, knight takes d4, knight c5. The center is well controlled by the remaining pawns, while the c5 knight is on the greatest possible spot on the board. Black is doing fine. All that is granted by white being forced after b4 and a5 to advance their b pawn to b5, turning the c5 square into an outpost. Now, when white rook is standing on b1 instead of on a1, after a5, white can simply reply with a3 and keep space advantage on the queen side without weakening any square. Back to the game, black played a5, preventing white's plan of b4, of course. And white continued with d5. I'm sure that white could have waited a bit longer with this critical decision, but the timing is based on the idea that any time black does c6 takes d5, there is going to be a hole on b5, from which white knight is able to put a lot of pressure on black queenside weaknesses, especially eyeing the c7 square and the d6 pawn. The moment white pushes d5, black gets their knight to c5. Definitely black is not intending to go according to what white imagined to play c6 takes d5 and weaken their own position for no reason. Alright, white continues with bishop e3 and black goes with queen c7. The queen needs to move because there is a threat of losing material in view of d takes c6 and bishop takes c5 thanks to the pin. White goes with h3, defends white bishop from harassment in view of knight g4. On the other end, trading for the knight on c5 is often seen as giving away amazingly important dark square bishop, and nothing can justify it. Right, black plays bishop d7. I like it because it defends the b5 square, which is essential in case black decides to trade on d5. Concretely speaking, the bishop supports b7, b5, which, if the pawn survives there, potentially gives black initiative and space advantage on the queen side. Rook b to c1. I'd prefer knight e2, but this is also fine. And then g6. Now this move doesn't make sense at first glance, but it holds a strong and meaningful idea to eventually push f7, f5. And g6 is not only an additional supporter, it is an intention of black to recapture on f5 with that pawn instead of using a piece. Of course, only in case white goes for e4 takes f5 eventually. Also, this move doesn't weaken black's king's position because there is, well, the dark square bishop sitting on f8, covering those squares that the pawn just left. We had knight e2. This move is useful for multiple reasons. Now we control the h5 square with the light square bishop. Typically, that square is interesting for black's knight from f6 which wants to free up the f7 pawn, well, anyway, going somewhere, but via h5, it can reach the beautiful f4 square. The d2 knight is also defending the e4 pawn, and finally, from d2, it is able to reach, potentially, the c4 square, in case, of course, black does the c6 takes d5 thing. 
Black goes with rook a to b8. Rook wants to support b7, b5 once the c6 takes d5 is done. Assuming white recaptures, of course, with the c pawn. White goes with knight to b3. An amazing effort to remove black c5 knight. All that thanks to the d4, d5 pawn advance. That's how difficult the moment of advancing the d-pawn is for white in the king's Indian and here in the old Indian. Finally, white is ready to take the knight on c5 using not their valuable dark square bishop, but an ordinary knight. Black took it and white took with the queen. This means that there is not going to be b7, b5, while black's queen is standing on c7 and white's rook on c1. Plus, the queen on b3 is defending b5 directly. And black plays c5. This is another big decision, this time made by black. And be sure that every pawn push or capture in the center is one of the critical moments of the game. This was a painful decision for black, as there is not going to be b7, b5. Plus, the b5 square is turning into an outpost for white. And only white is the one able to, at some point, create a break on the queen side, playing a3 and b4. Now, black's concession is made with an idea that they are going to be faster in developing initiative on the king side, while the other flank, queen side, is locked for a certain time. White played king h2. And what's the point of this move? I'll give you a couple of seconds to guess. Or maybe pause the video if you want. It is not the greatest move in chess history, or anything even close to it. And maybe it is not even the best move in this position. But the plan is one of the typical ones under this pawn structure. That's why it is important for me to ask this question. It is related with the idea of striking on the king side, the same way black is interested in going for the f7, f5 pawn break. f to f4. In other words. But why would white need their king on h2 for that to happen? Well, let's see what happens if at some point we push f4 without having another pawn on g3 to support it. We may end up recapturing on f4 with the dark square bishop, but there is going to be a hole on e5, and our pawn on e4 is going to be backwards. Now, moving the king to h2 is starting a process of pushing g3 and then f4. However, playing g3 without having the king on h2 leads to losing the h3 pawn. So, that's the reason for king h2. Black plays king h8. Similar plan. Only this time, black plays with their king in order to free up the g8 square for their knight, so that the f7 pawn can finally move to f5. Okay, queen c2. This move is required because f4 won't work until we have the e4 pawn protected. Otherwise, black just takes on f4 and then takes a free pawn on e4. Black plays knight g8 and now bishop g4. This move is interesting for those of about 2000 rating points, I'd say. Because it seems like a great opportunity to exchange the light square bishops. And we know that white's light square bishop is worse than black's, since our pawns are on the same color. Plus, if black exchanges on g4, it works even better for white, because we get another pawn to protect the f5 square. Moreover, this move stops black from directly pushing f5. Can we ask for more than that? I don't know. But I can remind you of another guideline. It says that when we have more space, we'd prefer not to trade, because that way we are helping the remaining opponent's pieces to move in their restricted space. If you'd ask me 25 years ago, what do I think of this move, I'd probably say that it is an excellent choice. And if you'd ask me now, probably I wouldn't play it in my game. And if I'd be teaching someone new to chess, I'd show this as an example of an excellent choice for why to get rid of their bad bishop. A verdict depends on who we are talking to or explaining this move and position. All right, black plays knight h6, hitting the bishop on g4 and preparing to finally push f5. Well, take on d7 and queen takes on d7, okay? Queen d2. 
attacking the knight, but abandoning defense over the f5 square. Black only needs to make sure that the knight is safe and then push f5. So we got knight g8, and then white pushes g4. This is one way to play against f5 idea. It is weakening the f4 square, but black can't exploit it at this point. Also, white's king isn't that much worsening, because the center is locked. The other white's plan against the f5 is to prepare e takes f, and after g takes f, to push f4. It's a long story, and I don't want to discuss it in this video, but just want to say that I prefer that one over g4. Alright? Black played f5, as expected, of course. White reacts with f3. Trading on f5 would lead to a position that is also quite stable and promising for white. For example, g takes f, g takes f, e takes f, queen takes f5, and rook g1, as we can see, white pieces are very active. Now let's again slow down and ask what black is supposed to do. The game is closed, time is to maneuver the pieces and find good squares before we start an attack. Now, looking at the black's pieces, we can see that all of them want to improve. But if we'd start with the bishop, where it belongs according to the current pawn structure. Take your time and try to find how to improve that piece in two moves. Okay, the active square it can get to is h4, and we can get there via e7 in two moves only. That way we are also clearing the back rank in order to start bringing our rooks either to the f or g file. We're going to play out the bishop's move because there is no clear way to improve our knight other than just moving it to f6 or e7, but in both cases it locks the bishop's way towards the h4 square. Rook g1. Black plays rook f8. Of course bishop h4 was possible, but this move puts more pressure on white especially on the f-file, which can potentially become open. Rook c f1 and rook f7. Now, bishop h4 was possible again, but Kotov thinks that it is not as important as inflicting pressure immediately. We had g takes f, g takes f, and rook g2. It was extremely important for white to trade once again on f5 and create an artificial outpost for their knight on e4. Otherwise, well, just pay attention what we get. Black plays f4. This way we're grabbing a significant amount of space on the king's side. It means great chances for the attack. Currently white is controlling the g-file, but it doesn't mean much if the other pieces can't coordinate with those rooks. And since there is no space, that coordination is unlikely to happen. That's why black feels completely safe on the king's side. Okay, bishop f2 played and rook f6. Black has their target, the h3 pawn. Now the idea is rook h6 and game over. So white plays knight e2, but that's actually already very bad position for white. Of course white wants to secure the h3 pawn playing knight g1 on their next move. Averbach felt like there is enough time to execute this plan, but black may not agree with it. Let's get deeper into this position and think of black's possibilities, because there is a way to crush white at this point. Believe it or not, the engine is screaming unbelievable minus 10 at this point. Pause the video and try to find the winning combo for black. Search for the only weak spot in white's camp. As we said, it is the h3 pawn. Then, Use the well-known guideline, check for checks, captures, and threats. Can you find something at least interesting for further speculation? The move is queen takes h3. Yeah, an astonishing sacrifice. But how exactly black can checkmate white in next couple of moves? Because black is going to be down all queen. And that's what makes this move legendary. Well, this sacrifice, legendary and this game immortal. There is no immediate checkmate, only an intuition that the king won't find shelter anytime soon. Now, of course, we need to calculate until some point when we can say that the game seems satisfying enough. All right, king takes h3, rook h6, there is no point of playing anything else. King g4, 
and then knight f6. Getting the knight into the game, but we still have weak light squares. That's going to be our task, to cover those using only our rooks. Okay, king f5, and this is another critical moment. The king is able to stay on f5, but also potentially go to e6. Now, we don't want to exclude an option for white to sacrifice their knight or the f4 pawn. They have huge material advantage. They would potentially remove two pawns of black, thus free up more squares for their king. Now, having all that in mind, what should we do here? Take your time, pause the video if you need it, and let's see what's the best way to continue the attack. Knight e7. Mainly, black is preparing to checkmate by involving the other rook to f8, checking, and after king g4, rook g8, check again, king goes back to f5, and then just rook f6. Now, the knight's sacrifice won't help, say, knight xf4, rook f8, king g4, rook g8, check, and now white needs to start throwing their pieces in front of the king, losing every one of them, say, knight g6, rook g takes g6, king f5, rook h5, check, and now the queen throws herself in front, bishop takes queen, with checkmate to follow. Rook g5 was done by white, rook f8, check, king g4, Basically, what white is doing is hoping to hide their king behind the rook. Knight f6, king to f5, knight back to g8, king g4. Since white is not able to go anywhere else, black decides to repeat the position and thus get through the first time control. Once he gets over move 40, he gets more time on his clock, he can start thinking how to checkmate the opponent's king. So he needs more time on his clock, he's probably in time trouble, that's why he's repeating and doing these things with the knight. Okay? So he went with knight to f6, and then king f5, and knight took on d5. Wasn't really greatest thing to do, but he is trying to restart the threefold repetition process. He doesn't want to go back with the knight because it would end in a draw because of this threefold repetition. This way he is taking a pawn, creating a new situation on the board, so that he can repeat again a couple of times, checking the white's king, passing the move 40, and getting more time on his clock so he can start thinking again and see how exactly he's going to go after the white's king. I think otherwise, he wouldn't take on d5. We had king g4 and knight f6 check. King f5, knight g8, king g4, knight f6, king f5, knight g8. You see, he's definitely repeating the moves. Once you pass move 60, you get half an hour more. Kotov needs a lot of time to calculate, but the moment is there to decide to either accept to draw the game or to continue hunting the king. King g4, here is that moment, he takes on g5. White took the bishop, but if white doesn't capture it, playing for example queen e1, knight f6 check, king g5, rook h5 is mate. And in case the king goes to f5 instead, not taking the bishop, then knight g4 is an amazingly strong move, because black wants to get rid of their knight, and then to have an option to put a rook on g8. So king takes g4, rook to g8, king f5, and then bishop to d8, with an unavoidable checkmate ideas using two rooks and a dark square bishop. You can look at this position further, but there is no way you can save white. As mentioned, white decides to capture the g5 bishop. And then rook f7, threatening mate on g7. Now, if knight takes pawn on f4 again, we need to check always this knight sacrifice. It won't work here because of rook g7 check, knight g6, I would assume, because king f5 runs to rook f6 mate. And then rook g takes g6, king f5, and knight e7 mate. Okay, let's go back. Knight sacrifice won't work here, so white plays, well, the only remaining move in order to avoid getting checkmated, which is bishop h4. Rook g6 check, king h5. Now, let's try to find the final move, after which the game is definitely over. There is no immediate mate, but white is going to be forced to give everything in order to keep their king alive. Pause the video and find the best attacking move for black. All right. The move is rook f to g7, threatening mate on h6 in the next move. And what can white play here? In the game, we had bishop to g5, 
white is forced to start throwing their pieces again in front of the unstoppable black rooks. Rook takes g5, check, king h4, and then just knight at 6. Threatening mate on h5. Knight g3, because in case of knight f4, we have e takes f, renewing the threat of rook h5, and white cannot really help his king at all. Okay, rook takes g3, and then queen takes d6. And now you see, this wouldn't happen if there was no knight takes d5 earlier, if you remember, of course, that moment. But okay, this is completely winning for black anyway. We just need to renew the threat of checkmating on the h file. Rook 3 to g6. Okay, threatening rook h6 mate. White plays queen b8 check. And after rook g8, there is no way to prevent rook h6. Unless white sacrifices, of course, their queen, which forces them into a losing endgame. So white finally resigned. I really hope you enjoyed this immortal game, the remarkable queen sacrifice, but also not to forget nor underestimate the ideas and plans in the middle game.